Hello and welcome back to my series of videos about the security of quantum key distribution. In this video, we want to focus on the classical post-processing part of a quantum key distribution protocol. So you probably remember this picture about the structure of QKD protocols from the last videos. In the last video, we have finished our discussion of the quantum transmission phase of a quantum key distribution protocol. So in this video, we focus only on the classical post-processing part that comes after the quantum transmission part. So when Alice and Bob have concluded the quantum transmission part, each of them holds a bit string. And the two bit strings, they are partially correlated and they are partially secret. So there are probably some errors in the bit strings. They won't be totally equal. And probably there will be some information that has been leaked to an adversary E. The first step that Alice and Bob perform in the classical post-processing is the parameter estimation step. So here they want to estimate the error rate in their strings. They simply want to get an, a number that tells them how, much, how many errors have happened in those strings to decide whether it is uh, reasonable to go on with the protocol or if it is necessary to abort it and try again. If the protocol, uh, if the, the two strings they have have passed the parameter estimation step, then they can go on and perform the error correction step. Here the goal is to make the two bit strings they hold equal bit strings, which means that after the error correction step, Alice and Bob now hold partially secret keys. So when I say key now, what I mean is that uh, Alice and Bob have the same strings. And partially secret means that, um, of course, Eve doesn't have the knowledge about the whole key, but she probably has some knowledge. So it's only partially secret. In the next step, Alice and Bob perform privacy amplification where they remove all the knowledge that Eve has on the key, which makes the key completely secret and therefore a secure key. This secure key can then be used in applications like the one-time pad that we have discussed many videos ago, for example. Okay, so let's have a, look, a closer look at the different steps that Alice and Bob have to do here. The first one is parameter estimation. So as I mentioned, the goal here is to estimate the error rate in the bit strings that Alice and Bob hold. The standard procedure is the following. Alice sends a small sample of her bit string to Bob, and Bob simply compares it to his string and estimates the error rate. This means that Alice and Bob have obtained the error rate of the sample that they use. Of course, they don't want to make the sample too big because then they don't have so many bits left for the key. But the, the actual quantity that we're interested in is the error rate of the remaining bit string. So the bit string that Alice and Bob want to use as a key. And the intuition here is that if the error rate of the sample is small, then the error rate of the remaining bit strings it probably is also small or around the same rate as the error rate of the sample. And um, making this intuition precise, like uh, mathematically proving this, we can use so-called chernoff hefting type bounds. What they say is, roughly speaking, that, for example, if the error rate of the sample is around 7%, then the error rate of the remaining bit strings is about 7 plus some small number epsilon percent with high probability. Okay, so there are um, several inequalities that we can use for those bounds and we want to have a closer look at one of them. And this one is called Serfling's inequality. So this theorem, which is due to Serfling, as it says, uh, tells us the following. Suppose you have a set of n random variables that we call ki with values um, small ki that are in the set 0, 1. And the index i goes from 1 to n. Then we can define the average of these random variables as 1 over n 
and summing up all the individual random variables. Suppose that we now draw a sample out of these random variables k. We draw the sample without replacement. This is important for the theorem. And we call the sample xj. Also, the values are again 0 and 1, as before. And the index goes from 1 to small n, where small n is, of course, smaller than big n. We can define the average of this random variable in a similar way. And then we define small k as the quantity big n minus small n. And we have a quantity beta this, that is between 0 and 1. Then the probability that the average of the sample x is bigger or equal to the average of the, the whole set of random variables, k, plus this value beta. This probability is smaller or equal to e to the power of minus 2 beta squared times small n times big n divided by k plus 1. Okay. We will see how this theorem is helpful in, um, in proving this intuition that I mentioned before. First, this inequality, in brief, is simply saying that the probability that the sample average x is bigger than the total average k is exponentially small in the sample size n. So to make this probability smaller, we simply have to increase the sample size. <clears throat> okay, let's see how we can apply this to parameter estimation. We begin with fixing some notation. So lambda n will be the error rate in the remaining n bits of the string. Lambda k is the error rate in the k sample bits. Then we have small lambda max. This is the threshold for the sample error rate. So if the error rate in the sample is above this threshold, then Alice and Bob will simply abort the protocol. And we also have a small constant that we call gamma. <clears throat> the quantity that we're interested in is now the probability that the error rate in the remaining n bits that Alice and Bob want to use for key generation, that this error rate is bigger than the error rate they have observed in the k sample bits, plus a small constant gamma. And of course, we're interested in the probability of this event depending on the event that, um, or there's a typo that should be big lambda k. So the error rate in the k sample bits is smaller or equal to the threshold that we have defined. Because otherwise, Alice and Bob would simply abort the protocol. OK, so this is the quantity of interest. And what we want is we want to have a a bound on this probability. We want to be sure that this probability is uh, small, because this is exactly the event that um, that we don't want to happen, that the error rate of the remaining bits is bigger than the error rate that we have observed. <clears throat> OK. We first fix some further notations. So we will denote Alice's key with Ka and Bob's key with Kb. And we can divide this bit string Ka into a part which is used for the, the sample and a part which, is, uh, which represents the remaining bits, similar with Bob's key. Then the error rate in the remaining bits, lambda n, is defined as 1 over n times this quantity where we have the um, bitwise addition modulo 2 between the strings of Alice and Bob's respective keys. So this operation gives zero when Alice and Bob have uh, the same bit string at a position. And it gives one when Alice and Bob have a different bit at that position. So if this operation outputs one, then there's an error. And the absolute value then simply uh, stands for that we take all the number. So this is the number of positions where Alice and Bob's bit strings differ. And we can do the same definition for the sample error rate. Furthermore, we can define in some quantity nu, which is defined as k divided by big N. So the, num the, the number of sample bits divided by the number of 
total bits that we have. And then we can define the total error rate that simply denoted lambda, similar to the error rates we have defined before, only that now we use the complete, the, the whole bit strings that Alice and Bob have. And we can express this using new as a linear combination of the error rate of the sample bits and the error rate of the remaining bits. Okay, so this was lots of notation. And now we go to probabilities. Here we will use Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem tells us that the probability of an event A conditioned on an event B is equal to the probability of the event B conditioned on event A times the probability of the event A divided by the probability of the event B. So Bayes' theorem is formulated for so-called events. And here you can simply think of an event as the realization of a random variable that is sufficient for our purposes. From this theorem, we can directly follow that the probability of A conditioned on B is small or equal to the probability of A divided by the probability of e, B, simply because probabilities are always between 0 and 1. And if I erase the probability of B uh, conditioned on A, then we get the statement on the right side. We now apply this uh, inequality to get an upper bound on the quantity of interest. So here the event A is that the error rate of the remaining bits is greater or equal to the error rate of the k sample bits plus a small constant gamma. And the event B is that the error rate of the sample bits is small or equal to the threshold lambda max. Then we get this upper bound on our quantity of interest. And here we can now find an upper bound on the uh, nominator of the fraction on the right side in the following way. So we can simply multiply every quantity with new that doesn't change the inequality in any way. Then we can rearrange this inequality a bit such that now we are looking at the probability of the probability of the event that the error rate of the n remaining bits is greater or equal to nu times the error rate of the k sample bits plus 1 minus nu of the times the error rate of the n remaining bits plus a constant nu gamma. And as you can see here, the this linear combination is exactly how we have defined the total error rate. So what we actually have here is the probability that the error rate of the n remaining bits is greater or equal to the error rate of the whole string plus a small constant nu times gamma. And now, as you can probably see, this is the point where we can use self-length inequality because now this is exactly the, the way self-length inequality was formulated. We have a sample of size n and we have the, to the, the error rate of the total bit string. And here it is important that we choose gamma such that nu times gamma is a quantity between 0 and 1. But we said in the beginning that gamma is a small constant and nu is a constant smaller than uh, 1, so that's not a problem. Now we apply surfing's inequality, so we get this upper bound on the probability. We can then reinsert it into um, the, the inequality in the beginning here. So we get this upper bound on our quantity of interest. I've replaced the denominator simply with the probability p pass because it simply represents the probability that the protocol passes the parameter estimation test. And now you can see that the probability that um, the error rate in the remaining bits is greater or equal to the error rate in the sample bits plus some small constant is exponentially small in the sample size k. So here we can um, make this probability smaller and we want this probability to be as small as possible. 
simply by increasing the sample size. So here you can see something that is um, the general problem in the classical post-processing, that on the one hand, you want to have these probabilities that an error occurs. You want to make these probabilities as small as possible. But on the other hand, you also want to make the size of the samples you take as small as possible, because these bits are simply discarded afterwards. So this is always something you have to um, decide. How small do you want the probability to be? Or like how many bits can you use for the parameter estimation? <clears throat> okay, but this now um, quantifies and mathematically proves the intuition that if the some, if the error rate in the sample size is small, then also the error rate in the remaining bits will be small, given that you have used an, a big enough sample size. So the next step in the classical post-processing is now error correction. So suppose our bit strings have passed the parameter estimation test, then we proceed by doing error correction. The goal of error correction is to make Alice and Bob's bit strings equal at the cost of revealing some information to Eve. <clears throat> so the general procedure is the following. On Alice's side, she holds her key string um, or her bit string Ka. Then she uses some sort of error correction protocol that I denoted EC here uses this to encode some information about her key uh, or her bit string and sends it over to Bob. Bob then uses this information he got from Alice as well as the information he has because he also holds a bit string that is correlated with Alice's string, uses both of these information together to estimate a guess of Alice's bit string. And this is simply a classical error correction problem. There is nothing quantumly in it. Only classical quantities are involved. And this is a well-studied problem where there are many classical error correction protocols that one can use. So we won't go into detail about these kind of error correction codes. But what we are interested, interested in is independent of the protocol, how can we check that the error correction was successful? Because this is important. Alice and Bob need to make sure that error correction was successful because if it wasn't and they proceed with the protocol, then they have insecure keys in the end. And since error correction can sometimes be a probabilistic procedure, things can go wrong. Okay, how do we check that the error correction procedure was successful? Here, we use so-called two universal hash functions. Let's go to the definition of these functions step by step. So we begin with a family of functions and that is denoted f from an alphabet x to an alphabet z. And we have a probability distribution on f that we denote pf. This pair f together with its probability distribution is called two universal if the probability that if we apply the fun a function from this family to an input x, the probability that this um, is equal to the function applied to another element um, of the alphabet, x prime, is smaller or equal to 1 over the cardinality of the alphabet z, whenever the two inputs, x and x prime, are not equal. And the function f is chosen randomly from this family of functions according to the given probability distribution pf. Okay, what this means is that whenever you have two different inputs, then the probability that the output of the function is the same, even though the inputs were different, this probability is very small. In fact, it is the smaller, the bigger the alphabet Z. So by choosing these, this family of functions, so by choosing this alphabet Z, you can um, make this probability smaller. And this is what you want when you do error correction. Because 
this is a way that Alice and Bob can detect errors without uh, without making the, the actual values of their strings public. They can instead compare the outputs of these functions. And if the outputs are um, they're different, then no, um, if the outputs are equal, then they can be very sure that the inputs have also been the same. <clears throat> okay, so the checking procedure is then straightforward. Alice chooses at random a function from this family of uh, functions from the two universal hash functions. We denote this FEC. She evaluates this function on her key and sends it to Bob along with her choice of function. And then Bob evaluates the function on his bit string and compares it to Alice's output. And if the values differ, then they abort because then they say the error correction procedure wasn't successful. <clears throat> but if the hash values are equal, then according to the definition of two universal hash function, functions, Alice and Bob can be very sure that the actual inputs, so the keys, are also equal, if they have chosen the alphabet Z big enough, of course. OK, so if the error correction procedure was successful, then Alice and Bob can proceed with privacy amplification. Of course, during the error correction process, some information about the key has been leaked to Eve. This, together with the information that Eve gained during the quantum transmission phase, has to be removed because Alice and Bob want the key to be secure. So how do they remove Eve's knowledge of the key? What they use here is a so-called randomness extractor. This is, this is a function that has as inputs a source of randomness, which is uh, the bit strings in our case, and a small uniformly random string, which we call the seed. It then outputs an almost uniformly random string that is longer than the seed. So, okay, so we want to apply this kind of function to the strings, but this is not enough. We have more requirements. The first one is that the output string should be independent of the seed because the seed, it isn't um, maybe uh, necessary to communicate the seed that they use. So this is covered by the term strong randomness extractor. The second requirement is that we have to take a quantum adversary into account because Eve is sitting there and has some uh, knowledge about the key. And of course, we model her with a quantum system. So we not only want to extract randomness from the bit strings that Alice and Bob have, but we want to extract randomness with, in the presence of a quantum adversary. And this is captured by the term quantum proof strong randomness extractor. OK, we will see the definition in a minute. But before, we have to talk about the kind of systems and quantities that appear in the definition. OK, so we will do this explanation only for Alice's system, because after the error correction step, Alice and Bob hold identical strings. So everything that Alice does Bob simply does the same to his string in order to obtain equal uh, key strings in the end. So we only describe uh, what happens to Alice's system. Here. So Alice holds a bit string, which is modeled by a classical random variable x. Then we have the quantum adversary E, which is described simply by a quantum system E. The state of the composite system of Alice and Eve can then be described by a classical quantum system. We have seen this before when we talked about the, the mathematical preliminaries. So this classical quantum system is rho xe, where Alice's system is described by, by an states of an orthonormal basis x that encode the, the classical bits. And Eve's state is described by a quantum state rho e indexed by x. And everything is weighted with the probability distribution Px of x. What we 
also have is a system that describes the seed. We simply denoted row y. The actual state is not so important. What is important is that in the end, the state, so the, the final key is independent of the seed. We also have to quantify Eve's information because we have to make sure that Eve doesn't have too much information. If she already knows the whole key, then there's no point in trying to make it secure. And we will quantify Eve's information by the quantum conditional min entropy. So this is an entropy that we have not seen before. And the definition looks rather technical and not very intuitive but it is the operational interpretation of this uh, entropy that will match exactly what we want. We'll see that. So first we talk about the definition. So the quantum conditional min entropy of a bipartite state row AB that is conditioned on the state of the system B is defined as follows. So we begin from the inside. So what we are interested in is a parameter lambda that fulfills the inequality that the state row AB is smaller or equal to lambda times the identity on system A tensored with a state sigma on system B. And this, so there's a set of all parameters that fulfill this equation given a, a state sigma B. And we're interested in the minimum value lambda that fulfills this inequality. So we take the minimum over the step, uh, over the set. Then we also take the minimum over all possible states sigma b for system b. And in the end, we take minus the logarithm of this value. OK, this definition is like really not obvious why it should be suitable for our needs, but the operational interpretation of this entropy is if you have a classical quantum state, then the quantum conditional min entropy characterizes the amount of uniform randomness that we can extract from the classical random variable, which is correlated with the quantum system in a way that the result is independent of the quantum system. And this is exactly what we required uh, before, so what we talked about. We will not justify why this operational interpretation um, matches the quantum conditional min entropy, because this goes beyond the scope of this course. So you simply have to believe me for now, but you can, of course, look it up yourself. OK, so this is how we quantify Eve's information. And we're now ready to state the definition of a quantum proof strong randomness extractor, which is the following. So the quantum proof strong randomness extractor has two parameters, k and epsilon. And in principle, it is simply a function from an alpha, from uh, the set of, of bit strings of length n and the set of bit strings of length d that maps to the set of bit strings of length m. But of course, it has to fulfill some requirements. So for all classical quantum states rho xe with a classical random variable x with min entropy, h min of x dependent on e is bigger or equal to k, and a uniform random seed y, we have the following inequality. So one half times the so-called trace distance of the state after we have applied the randomness extractor x to this product state, where we have the maximally mixed state tensored with the state of the C tensored with the system E. This distance is smaller or equal to epsilon. OK, you haven't seen this trace distance before. This is simply a, um, a distance that is induced by the trace norm. And I have written down the definition below. So the trace norm of the state row is defined as the trace of the square root of rho dagger times rho. And then you can simply make uh, a distance out of that by using the 
um, the difference of two states. <clears throat> okay, so you can see we have used the quantum conditional min entropy to um, characterize how much information Eve has. And it is important that we have a lower bound in this uh, quantity, because as I said, the operational interpretation is that this characterizes the amount of uniform randomness that we can extract. And if this entropy is zero, then there is no randomness that we can extract in a way such that our requirements are fulfilled. So having this lower bound on the min entropy guarantees that we are able to extract randomness. And then, as you can see, this so the state rho x y e um, is the state that we have after we have applied the randomness extractor to Alice's string x, given the seed y. So this is the, the actual state that we have in the end. And the state on the right side is the, the optimal state. So here we have the maximally mixed state on, um, system, on, the, on Alice's system, which represents uh, the uniformly random string that she holds. And this is independent uh, first of the seed, and it is also independent of Eve's system. So everything is in tensor product form. This is the optimal situation. And the trace distance, be, um, so the distance between these two states is small or equal to epsilon. So this guarantees that the real situation is not too far away from the optimal situation. And of course, it's great if you can make epsilon as small as possible. Then the real situation comes closer to the optimal situation. Okay, so this definition looks very abstract. And of course, you ask yourself, like, uh, are there actually functions that fulfill this definition? And yes, there are. And you have already seen them. So two universal hash functions are an example of a quantum proof strong randomness extractor. So I will not prove this statement here because that will take a whole uh, different video. But we will simply um, believe this and use like existing proofs in the literature. So if you, um, if Alice and Bob have access to two universal hash functions, then the strategy is very simple and straightforward. Alice chooses a function that we denote FPA from a family of two universal hash functions at random. And here, this choosing the function at random from a family of functions, this requires some randomness. This is where the seed comes in. So here, Alice uses the randomness from the seed to randomly choose a function from this family. She applies it to her string. And then she announces her choice so that Bob can apply the same function to his string. And after this step, Alice and Bob hold two identical key strings, because if the strings have been equal after the error correction step, then applying this function to them will not change the, so will not make the strings different. So after this step, Alice and Bob hold the same key strings, and now these strings are independent of Eve's system. So this is this now fulfills all the requirements that we have for a key that can be safely used in applications. Okay, so to sum it up, the classical post-processing basically involves three steps. First, Alice and Bob have to estimate the error rate so they can decide if it is worth to continue with the protocol. And then they do error correction to transform their partially secret correlation into a partially secret key. So now they hold identical strings, but still Eve has some information on this. And then they perform privacy amplification to turn these partially secret keys into secure keys, where Eve does not have any knowledge on the key string. So this concludes our study of quantum key distribution protocols. And in the next video, we can begin with talking about the security of these protocols in more detail. So we first need to define what we actually mean when we say security. 
this will be an important part. And then we can also talk about the kind of attacks that Eve can perform. We have also already seen the uh, photo number splitting attack in the previous video. And we will prove the security of the BB84 protocol in one of the forthcoming videos and also talk about other strategies to prove the security of a protocol. Okay, so I hope you have enjoyed this video and I hope to see you next time.